Hello and welcome to this webinar concerning the status of um, Nagorno-Karabakh. My name is uh, Tarek Knutsen. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Bergen. Uh, and with us also we have uh, uh, Lene Vetteland uh, from the head of the Russia department in the Norwegian Helsinki committee and an expert on Armenia. We have Kori Johan Mjör, an associate professor at the University of Bergen. Uh, specializing in Russian and Soviet history. Uh, we have Helge Blakisrud, who is a senior research fellow at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, main research uh, interests include Russian federalism and center region relations, uh, among other things. So to all of you out there, welcome to this webinar. We have approximately one hour uh, I will let the panelists talk in the uh, beginning and afterwards we will open for some, uh, for some questions uh, in the Q&A function in Zoom or uh, in the chat uh, window. That will be run by uh, Bergen Global with Anja Tucker. So I would like to start with you, uh, Kori Hamir. We have recently seen uh, fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, ending in a peace treaty uh, this November, considered by the Azerbaijanis at least as uh, a victory concerning control of uh, or influence in this enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh, where the majority of people are, uh, are Armenian. Could you please uh, give us uh, an introduction to the historical status of this area. Thank you. I'll try. Uh, I will talk about the uh, history of this region and uh, this conflict, uh, the history of Nagorno-Karabakh as an area of uh, conflict and also the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, what you choose as your starting point will, of course, frame the interpretation. Um, today's conflict has much to do about the Soviet legacy where the borders were drawn, but there are also certain aspects of it that goes even further back to the 19th century that are relevant to bring up here. So uh, I will talk about that as well. But the first explicit conflict between Armenians and Azerbaijanis uh, was in the early 20th century in 1905. I'll get back to that. Um, so I will start with talking about uh, the 19th century and uh, the history of this region in Imperial Russia. Now, South Caucasus uh, was conquered by Russia in the early 19th century. Started with Georgia, which became a uh, province of the Russian Empire in 1901, having been a protectorate earlier. And then these lands further east that we are talking about today uh, were gradually incorporated uh, over the next decades uh, and fully incorporated by 19, uh, 1828. Um, so then uh, Russian imperial rule was established in South Caucasus. And this imperial rule created, um, in a way, a new Armenia, what the Russians call the Armianskaya Oblast, the Armenian province. And this, this province was Yerevan and Nakhichevan. This was kind of defined by Russian authorities as Armenia. In this area, there lived Armenians, but above all, Muslims or Azerbaijani people. Um, they, they made up the majority. Uh, and Yerevan was at that point not a particularly Armenian city, so to speak, at least the majority of inhabitants were, were Muslims. But there followed afterwards uh, immigration from the, in particular, the Ottoman Empire. So by the 1870s, after the Russo-Turkish War, Armenians made up the majority in Yerevan. Uh, and then oh, Russia also conquered the uh, areas further east, and they established, for instance, the Yelizaveta Pol province, which is today's western Azerbaijan. Uh, centered around Gansha, and uh, this is, was also the area where Nagorno-Karabakh was at that time and uh, still is, so to speak. Uh, so that belonged to another province of the Russian Empire, not, not uh, Armenia. So we can see that the, the imperial organization, administration and division of the land may have had some, some impact on how the borders later were drawn. And also the border between Armenia and Turkey today was drawn at that time. Um, so today the, the map tells us that Georgia is in the west, Azerbaijan in the east and Armenia in the middle. 
Um, in the past two centuries, the ethnic composition of this territory has been much more complex, even if we'd only talk about these three major nationalities. There's nothing unusually unusual about this, of course. It's the case in many places in the world, but it is also the land illustrates the difficulties about drawing borders uh, in areas with very mixed population where different ethnicities live together. Um, what we can say in somewhat simple terms is that Armenians were clearly the most urbanized people, um, which had to do with the professions that many Armenians had. They were many were traders, so meaning that Armenians in many areas became by time the middle class, uh, even capitalist, we could say. Uh, Georgians, by contrast, were predominantly either nobility or peasants. Uh, Armenians hardly had a nobility. Um, this meant, for instance, that Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia today, was for a long time a, a, a city dominated by Armenians. Uh, it was only in the, actually as late as the 1960s that uh, Georgians, for the first time, made up a majority of the inhabitants there. Uh, in the 19th century, it was very much an Armenian city. Um, and also there was a significant Armenian presence in Baku in the 19th century. And it only increased towards the late 19th century as uh, Baku became the oil capital of the Russian Empire, perhaps even of the world. Uh, and this had to do with um, this Armenian uh, professions, middle class, the role as capitalists, etc. So Baku attracted them. And so it was in Baku that the first real conflicts uh, between Armenians and Azerbaijanis emerged. And that was in the revolutionary year of 1905. And that was then between largely unskilled workers of a Muslim background and uh, what was seen as capitalists, uh, middle class Armenians. So this was a very, this resulted in a very bloody uh, conflict there, um, lasting for a year or so, 1905-1906. Um, and these and the later conflicts in the next revolutionary stage, 1918, uh, have remained in the collective memory of both peoples. Uh, both people see themselves as victims, though in perhaps in different places. Um, we can say that in Baku, for instance, there were Azerbaijanis who revolted against Armenians. In other areas, Shusha, for instance, uh, Armenians may have fired first. Um, but what we see in this conflict is that it, it is an ethnic conflict, but it is also a class conflict. And ethnicity and class overlapped, uh, as it did many places in the Russian Empire from Finland via the Baltic areas to Poland. Um, so uh, 1905 uh, was kind of the start of a serious conflict between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Again, started in Baku. Uh, after that, the period up to the revolution in 1917 was relatively quiet, uh, we should say. Um, so the, the next stage in the history of this conflict then comes with, with the revolution um, in 1917, or actually in the period after the revolution um, from 1918 onwards. Um, the Russian revolution led to a series of declarations of independence uh, all over the Russian empire, but in particular in the peripheries. Um, and that was quite consistent with the Bolshevik program. Um, so I'll say a few words about uh, how the Bolsheviks saw the nationality question and the uh, uh, imperialism. So the Russian Revolution of 1917, the October Revolution, was staged from above by the uh, Bolsheviks on behalf of the working class, of course. But not only the working class, also on behalf of the suppressed colonized nations. Um, so for Lenin, for instance, um, imperialism and capitalism were very, very much tied together. Um, so the revolution should also aim at liberating suppressed nations, not only the suppressed, the working class. And this meant that the early Soviet Union uh, favored, had a program for favoring all other nations, nearly all other nations than the imperialist Russian nation. Uh, the Bolsheviks saw them as underdeveloped, uh, the, the non-Russian nations. So they launched a massive project for nation building in many areas of the uh, former Russian empire based on the principle of self-determination, national self-determination, which was also a central idea to Lenin, not only to Woodrow Wilson. 
so what what the Bolsheviks did was this program of affirmative action, uh, actively supporting non-Russian non -Russian nations in their development, uh, so that they could take part in the revolution. Uh, but but to reduce ethnic conflicts in um, the new state was also a, a, a central goal here. And it should make socialism appealing. Uh, clearly for the Bolsheviks, so, uh, self-determination didn't mean sovereign states. They should all be part of the broader uh, Soviet state. But uh, what it did mean in practice was cultural autonomy uh, in terms of their own institutions, education in the local language, local leadership, uh, local leadership, uh, local ad administration, and also to have their own territory defined by borders, as long as the nation was of a sufficient size. So the Soviet nation building was also very much the process of territorialization to give each nation a, a territory. Um, connecting nation and national identity with a specific territory. This was also a central idea for Stalin. Uh, and it also meant that Soviet Union became a federalist state. And this raised in turn the issue of where to draw the borders. Um, and Nagorno-Karabakh then, which we are talking about today, uh, is also a very good reflection of this. Uh, it led to the question where to draw the borders between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan and what kind of status should this area have. So these principles that I've talked about now was what happened after Soviet power was established. Um, but as I said also, 1918 led to declaration of self uh, of independence many places, including in the South Caucasus. So um, the years 1918 to 1920 are, well, uh, it's a very complex period. Power changes hand many times. Um, it's difficult to give a full and very easily understandable overview, but I'll try to say a few words about it. Um, but the conflict between Az Azab Armenians and Azerbaijanis re-emerged then in 1918, again starting in Baku, where revolutionary Armenians had held power within the framework of this Baku commune. Um, so there we had a conflict re-emerging, and then the conflict again spread westwards uh, towards Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the area was then uh, invaded first by the Ottoman Empire, forces from the Ottoman Empire, and then British forces. Um, and again, as Nagorno-Karabakh became a battlefield between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh too had a short period of independence in 1918, but then power would shift hand several times. Uh, but it's commonly held that it was Baku the Azerbaijani power there was so preoccupied with Nagorno-Karabakh that it made it quite easy for uh, the Red Army to kind of retake Baku and so that Azerbaijan became Soviet again in 1920. So Azerbaijan became Soviet uh, later that year, Armenia too became Soviet. Um, as long as only Azerbaijan was Soviet, the Bolsheviks supported uh, the Armenian uh, case in Nagorno-Karabakh that this area should be Armenian. When also Armenia became Soviet, uh, the kind of support shifted in favor of, uh, of Armenia. So again, we see that the Bolsheviks at some period supported Armenia, at other periods supported Azerbaijan. Um, uh, so they held shifting opinions. Um, but then the final decisions were made in 1921. There was a two-day conference uh, by organized by the Kokoshan Bureau, which oversaw these issues related to nationality, the nationality questions in the South Caucasus. And even at that conference in July 1921, we could see that on the first day, uh, there was a clear support for uh, Nagorno-Karabakh belonging to Armenia. And then suddenly the next day, the whole thing shifted and the final decision was that it should belong to Azerbaijan. And then it was uh, defined as an autonomous region two years later. Um, it's very difficult to say what happened, all the, uh, to talk about all the details at this meeting. We do not know what happened on stage and in particular behind. Uh, the Commissar of Nationalities, uh, Joseph Stalin, that was his uh, title position then, he was present at least on the first day. Uh, so that it, uh, it has often been seen as his intervention, uh, but you can't really blame him for the whole thing. Uh, there was also uh, Azerbaijani uh, representative presence who had a 
had uh, who were quite strong. Uh, Nariman Narimano, for instance, held to be a, a very strong Republican local leader, uh, and Azerbaijan had also a strong Communist Party. It has been said that the Armenians' representatives at this meeting, this decisive meeting, were more inexperienced. So that may have also had uh, something to say. And in any case, local interests also mattered, along with uh, foreign policy interests and uh, interests related to this, the whole state as such. So um, to sum up then um, the result or the, the conflict so far and the situation so far by the early 1920s, one could say that Nagorno-Karabakh is clearly, is perfectly normal in some sense. It reflects the Bolshevik logic of providing a large ethnic group with its own territory within another republic and give them relative autonomy as the Azerbaijani people of, uh, sorry, the Armenian people of uh, Azerbaijan here received. Um, so, uh, and there were several other kinds of this uh, autonomous regions in the Soviet Union, in Georgia, for instance, in Russia. But of course, what made it special was that we have here a titular republic, Armenia, in the neighborhood, uh, while Nagorno-Karabakh of the same ethnicity is situated within another republic, Azerbaijan. That made it a special case. There are no comparable uh, cases uh, to Nagorno-Karabakh in that sense. So it reflects uh, Bolshevik uh, national policy, uh, nation and territory should coincide to some extent, but it also showed that other, uh, other factors had an impact. Foreign policy issues mattered. Uh, it had to do with Turkey, of course. Uh, the Soviet leaders wouldn't, would, not, would not provoke Turkey too much. Um, and this is obvious from the correspondence of the Bolshevik leaders, Stalin included. Um, so certain concessions to Armenian, uh, to, to Azerbaijan were made in due to this reason. And also the initiatives of powerful Republican leaders, Nariman Narimanov in Azerbaijan, mattered, played a role. Uh, so you could say that Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, as an autonomous uh, region in Azerbaijan, uh, was both consistent with the Bolshevik policy and somewhat arbitrary. Uh, other concerns also were taken into account. Uh, so that's the situation by the early 1920s. Uh, so perhaps I should stop there. And... Yes, thank you very much for the um, uh, historical background. Uh, it's obviously a very complex history. Uh, uh, on all sides, uh, and of course, then you have the Soviet nationalities policy uh, from the 1920s onwards. And we have to move then approximately 70 years uh, ahead in time until the end of uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, this simmering conflict then uh, suddenly became hot again. I would like you, Helge, to uh, tell us about uh, what happened. Thank you, Talia, and uh, thank you for the invitation to, to join you here today in, in this discussion. Uh, yes, let's uh, fast move fast forward to the late uh, Soviet period, when Glasnost uh, uh, offered a window of opportunity for uh, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh to voice their grievances uh, against Baku, and against uh, having uh, this autonomous status within uh, the Azerbaijani Union Republic instead of being a regular part of uh, the Armenian Republic. This emerged as a political demand in the late 80s. Uh, it led to a uh, uh, violent, uh, or it le led to, to a low intensity conflict that emerged into a full war with uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991 and a, uh, a civil war that lasted until uh, spring 1994 when uh, a ceasefire war was concluded. It was an extremely bloody civil war. More than 30,000 30, people were killed and it uh, led to uh, uh, large-scale displacement of people, both Armenians and Azerbaijanis. So uh, 
uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in the areas around uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, as well as in Armenia and the rest of Azerbaijan. Uh, there were large-scale large, large, scale, large scale displacement, and one often says that some something like one million people were uprooted uh, as a result of this conflict. And then it ended uh, with a Moscow brokered ceasefire in 1994. And almost a quarter of a century has passed, or more than a quarter of a century has passed uh, since the ceasefire uh, was agreed. But we have come no closer to uh, a resolution of, of this uh, conflict in uh, the time that has passed. During this decades, the de facto state authorities in Nagorno-Karabakh have actively engaged in, in state building. They have developed a, a parallel state and society, what in uh, the literature is often referred to as a de facto state. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, a uh, de facto state is a state that has all the trappings of a regular state. It has borders, it has a defined population, it has uh, uh, authorities, uh, constitution, uh, an elected parliament, etc., etc. Uh, but it's not uh, recognized by the international uh, community or at best recognized by one or a handful of, of states. And we have several examples of, of, of states like this around the globe. We have, it's, it's, uh, we have uh, more of them in the post-Soviet space than anywhere else, but uh, in the South Caucasus, we have Nagorno-Karabakh, we have Abkhazia, we have South Ossetia. Uh, we have, for example, um, Northern Cyprus. Uh, we have Somaliland, and some would also say that Taiwan uh, is a de facto state. Um, if you were to, to visit Nagorno-Karabakh, it would look like a well-functioning society. At, at first glance, uh, it would look like a normal state. Uh, you could visit the de facto ministry of foreign affairs, the de facto uh, parliament, uh, the de facto president's office, etc., etc. They would have a university, they would have an education system, they would have a healthcare system. Uh, so at first glance, it would look like a normal state, but it would lack that one fundamental thing, a membership in the international community of, of states. Uh, with all the implication that has, for example, that you cannot issue passports that people can use to, to travel with. You can't use an issue a currency that could be used for international transactions. You cannot uh, um, engage in international trades, uh, trade uh, based on international treaties, etc., etc. What the de facto state authorities in the Karabakh tried to do was to uh, when international recognition by trying to perform better than Baku. So uh, from, from at least the late 90s and, and, and what, onwards, uh, the strategy was to be uh, uh, the best pupil in the class, so to say, to be more democratic, to, uh, to have more civil liberties, and you would see it consistently in the international rankings when they started to include uh, unrecognized states in these rankings, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh would score better uh, than uh, Azerbaijan proper. Uh, with Kosovo being recognized by most of uh, the Western world as an independent state, you also got this uh, uh, idea, a, a strengthening of this, uh, this idea that you could earn sovereignty, earned recognition by performing well uh, to, to score high on, on these, uh, uh, these um, uh, in, in, in these areas of, of uh, uh, democracy and, and liberties. 
Um, at the same time, there was extremely little will to resolve the country through negotiations. Ever since the ceasefire was uh, uh, concluded back in 1994, we have had an international process where uh, uh, OSCE uh, with uh, the US, France and Russia are acting as co-chairs, uh, have had a process going on where they have tried to find a solution that would satisfy both uh, Armenian demands and uh, the Azerbaijani uh, stance on in, in this conflict. But there has been, despite uh, more than 25 years of negotiations, there have been no real progress here. There has been a, an agreement on what has been called uh, the basic principles. That is that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, is situated on Azerbaijani territory, that IDPs should be allowed to uh, return, that Nagorno-Karabakh uh, should have had uh, should have some kind of, of status within uh, Azerbaijan um, uh, and a few other uh, basic principles, but there has been no will to implement these basic principles because the two sides, the Karabakh Armenians and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Azerbaijanis, ha have not been able to agree on the sequencing here. What should come first, return of IDPs or a decision on, on status? And both Nagorno Karabakh and Armenia have, I would say, been uh, satisfied with this lack of progress because there was a thinking uh, uh, that the longer time would pass the more uh, uh, the situation on the ground would get entrenched and the more sort of the right uh, with the the local population have to this uh, territory so uh, Armenia and Nagorno Karabakh happy to live with status quo Azerbaijan growing impatience uh, with um, uh, Azerbaijan uh, and Ilham Aliyev, the president, uh, engaging in uh, large-scale upgrading of the military forces uh, and reserving the right to uh, resolve uh, the territorial issue uh, by military means uh, if uh, negotiations were not to uh, produce any, uh, any results. And this was the backdrop for the war that we saw uh, emerge in, in, in this fall. And I should add that uh, this has not been, uh, it's often referred to as a frozen conflict. Uh, and it's frozen in the sense that there's been no progress towards peace. And a solution, but it's not been uh, frozen in the in the sense that there have not been regular skirmishes, uh, sh um, firing across uh, the ceasefire line, and uh, casualties on an annual basis uh, as a result of the conflict. We have seen uh, a few years back we saw saw uh, a, a short. Uh, war uh, uh, flaring up, but that was over in four days. Uh, we saw some fighting going on this summer, but that was more of the what many would term the, sort of the, the regular fighting that you would see on an annual base. Uh, so it took many of us uh, by surprise when this large scale operation was launched in, um, in uh, late September this year. Uh, we've had a, a, a large-scale Azerbaijan uh, military buildup, but uh, the Armenians had had 25 years to fortify themselves. They had dug in, and conventional wisdom held that this would be a, a territory that would be very difficult to, to recapture. 
initially in the conflict, uh, this war uh, um, in, in uh, September, October and November this year, uh, the Azerbaijanis had rather limited progress. They made advances in the lowlands uh, between Nagorno-Karabakh proper and uh, the Iranian border. Uh, but at some stage, the whole Karabakhi defense more or less folded, had to pu pull back. And uh, with the fall of Shusha or Shushi in, uh, in um, early November, the situation for the uh, Armenians became desperate. Um, uh, if you control this city that is situated uh, on a, a, a mountaintop uh, just outside uh, uh, the um, uh, de facto capital in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, if you control that, then you control uh, also the city, uh, the, the, the capital. And uh, the army, the Azerbaijan is also uh, cut off uh, the connection between um, between uh, Armenia and uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the road through the Lachin corridor. So uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh became uh, isolated uh, uh, from, from the rest of, uh, or from, from Armenia. So, so the, the situation was desperate, and uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, Moscow intervened, uh, and uh, the Armenian um, Prime Minister, uh, the President of Azerbaijan, and the President of uh, uh, Russia agreed on a, a ceasefire uh, agreement uh, that uh, I would say was an, a huge success for Azerbaijan and uh, uh, a huge defeat uh, for the Karabakh Armenians in the sense that not only did they have to uh, give up all the territories that they had controlled around Nagorno-Karabakh proper, but they also had to cede those parts of Nagorno-Karabakh um, uh, that the Azerbaijanis had retaken during the conflict. Uh, and that leaves the whole de facto Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh as the Armenians call it, uh, in a very precarious situation, uh, only with temporary security guarantees uh, established by the presence of Russian peacekeepers. I think I've spent my time, so, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and, uh, and let's move forward. And then I could come back to the details maybe in the Q&A of the, of the um, uh, agreement and what kind of uh, long-term implications this might have. Okay, okay. thank you very much, uh, Helge. Uh, it's very interesting. As you said, it's been a frozen conflict uh, for quite a long time. Uh, there is both ethnicity and class involved uh, in this uh, conflict and you might see some similarities with other areas of the world trying to become uh, an independent state like Kosovo or the Kurds in uh, North Iraq for, uh, for instance. So there are some other parallels here. Um, a new dimension I believe also in this conflict this time is the more direct involvement of Turkey, uh, which um, uh, has been uh, quite a close ally with Azerbaijan. And the Azerbaijanis have been able to, due to their oil wealth, to buy weapons on the international market from both, I believe, Turkey and, and Israel. And um, another aspect of the war fighting in um, uh, this time is the um, high prevalence of drones, which have been used quite effectively by the uh, Azerbaijanis. Uh, of course, much cheaper than uh, heavier uh, equipment, but very effective. But of course, this conflict, uh, which is where we now have a brokered, brokered peace deal uh, instigated by, uh, by Russia, also have uh, human rights implications. We have killed, uh, hundreds of people killed. Uh, at least we have uh, a new wave of internally displaced people 
Uh, and I would like to bring in uh, Lena Vetteland from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. Uh, what is the uh, Helsinki Committee's position on this conflict now? Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, for inviting me and for for discussing this uh, this issue. Um, as my colleagues have mentioned, it's a, it's a complex uh, history and a complex uh, conflict. And one of the main uh, problems so far is that uh, during the war in the 90s, there was also several grave violations of, uh, of human rights and of international humanitarian law. And it has not been properly documented and followed up. So the impunity reigning from that conflict has been a great driver in the frozen conflict, which is not frozen in people's minds, uh, for sure, and also not uh, on the line of contact, and up until the war that started now uh, in September. Because when um, impunity reigns, there is no, uh, no real um, reason or incentive to, to solve the conflict. So what the Norwegian Helsinki Committee has been uh, doing now, in particular with this conflict, is that we have urged the Norwegian uh, government and other friendly governments to, to initiate uh, a commission of inquiry to document what has happened on the ground and to follow up uh, those findings uh, with, uh, uh, with real proceedings. Uh, there is already human rights organizations on the ground uh, and brave journalists and, and local actors who are collecting evidence. Uh, there is uh, videos circulating with, uh, with horrible uh, images of, uh, of grave violations and there are initiatives already collecting these um, but it would also be a benefit if it was um, through an international organization such as the UN or the OSCE that would facilitate uh, such a commission. So we recently uh, we sent one letter to the MFA and another this uh, this week actually uh, to, to follow up, to say that, yes, there is an agreement in place, but there is definitely time to, uh, and, and, an, and a need to intensify and, uh, and create this uh, commission, because now um, it's uh, relatively calm and it's possible to start uh, and develop this, um, and this commission. Um, because um, the serious violations that took place in the 90s, they, have, uh, they are very at the front of people's minds. And what has been lacking, uh, Helge mentioned the uh, Minsk group of the OECE. There have been some small attempts uh, on negotiations throughout the years, but the populations have not been informed uh, enough about these negotiations. And there has not been enough focus on the populations as such. There was an initiative in the so-called preparing the populations for peace, uh, but it has not been um, adequately followed up uh, on the ground um, almost on the contrary that the that the the hate relations between the neighboring countries has been uh, only growing again because there has been no real um, procedures or or no one has been found guilty of what happened uh, in the previous war and uh, that has of course created problems for the cooperation between the countries and the and the civil society and the populations of the two countries uh, some um, uh, peace building initiatives have been going on and cooperation between civil society organizations, but there has always been uh, a tension which has been difficult to overcome. And in a society such as uh, Azerbaijan, uh, a dictatorship, uh, human rights organizations have already been uh, marginalized for working for human rights. And if they, in addition, were to talk to Armenians about uh, reconciliation, that would be an initial um, problem uh, for them. And uh, on the Armenian side, more of a, a self-censorship has been um, a great problem that uh, you have not been imprisoned for, for talking to Azerbaijanis, but it hasn't been encouraged. And uh, it's, it's definitely not uh, a popular uh, thing to do. So it's, been, um, so it's been really problematic on both sides uh, in the um, recognized uh, countries. And in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, the current conflict has also shown that it's uh, the, the international community's approach to human rights and civil society in areas such as Nagorno-Karabakh, where there is a de facto state, as, as Helge described, with all the features of a, of a running government, except that the government is not formally in charge of the people's human, human rights, because that li lies with Baku in the case of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, the Jure in Azerbaijan, but they cannot influence the human rights situation in 
uh, in the de facto state. And also the uh, government of the de facto state cannot be formally held accountable because it's not a recognized state. And uh, international community find it difficult to support initiatives, humanitarian and uh, human rights initiatives in the country, uh, in, the, in the region, because they are afraid of inadvertently uh, acknowledging uh, the status of the territory. As a result, uh, the people who live there uh, are more or less left uh, to themselves. So in terms of supporting civil society and in terms of following up on human rights challenges, and that's another issue where the international community should think differently. And that was also one of the input uh, from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee to the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, now that they will take a seat in the Security Council, for example. Um, and, and before a meeting in the Human Rights Council, that the approach to civil society activists in also de facto states and un unrecognized territories should be handled differently so that civil society actors are able to function with support from international organizations and donors and states, uh, regardless of the formal status uh, of, of the territory, because um, someone has to do uh, something and that could be a, a way of doing it not formally donating funds to the to the governments or the de facto governments as such but to civil society actors who are working uh, on the ground to defend the people who actually live in these territories again regardless uh, of uh, of the status so these are some of the issues that uh, the Norwegian Helsinki committee is from uh, focusing on at the moment in cooperation with uh, other international uh, organizations that, uh, again, yeah, documentation and preventing impunity also from this conflict um, for, for the future. And um, again, uh, hatred has really uh, come back on social media and in, and in discussions. And it's uh, something that also has to be taken seriously. Um, in, in the continuation. It's more difficult to, uh, to address, but again, it shows the complexity of the conflict and how important it is that the international community is more, uh, is more involved. Uh, this conflict was allowed to, to develop um, more than it, it should have. Um, you can see the timing in terms of uh, OSCE being a bit um, between, between leaders, uh, the US being between in, uh, in this large uh, election um, process, uh, the COVID pandemic, and um, it, it created a vacuum, but still uh, there should be more international engagement uh, in what was going on. And of course, understandably, the people living there and, and taking part in the fighting on both sides felt uh, abandoned uh, by international community. So some of the procedures in documentation, for example, take a long time. Uh, it's very thorough work. Uh, what Human Rights Watch and Amnesty have published are um, predominantly press releases, I, uh, identifying some issues, but they are uh, working on more thorough reports, and where we're talking months. Uh, and a commission of inquiry will possibly take years. But the recent decision in the International Criminal Court in terms of uh, Ukraine shows that there is a possibility, and it's important to gather this information thoroughly and then at some point it will come in handy. Of course, it's, it's a very long process, but it's, uh, it's needed. And in the meantime, other more uh, urgent action should take, uh, should take place on, on the ground uh, in cooperation with civil society, which is now under greater stress uh, in, in Armenia, for example, uh, being threatened by those who are not pleased with, um, with the peace agreement, for example. So there is, um, yeah, there is many issues uh, that remain and uh, I will be happy to talk more about them. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lena. Uh, you say that there is an urgent need for a stronger international presence in the area, but uh, that might also be complicated by uh, the regional powers uh, like, uh, like Russia and Turkey and, uh, and their agenda uh, concerning this conflict. Turkey, of course, uh, is for all practical purposes, allied with uh, with Azerbaijan, giving them support of different kind. Uh, Armenia has traditionally been protected by uh, by Russia. Um, what can we say about uh, these shifting uh, alliances now? We have this new kind of alliance uh, between Russia and, and Turkey, uh, which we have seen grow 
for the last uh, several years. Um, um, what is the road ahead? Uh, is it possible for the international community uh, in total to, to, to make a stronger presence in this region? What is your perspective on that, Tael Helge? Um, well, it's, it's complicated. You, you said an alliance between uh, Russia and Turkey, and to some extent, they might want to bilateralize what's going on in South Caucasus. But uh, the Turkish-Russian relationship is also very complicated. They are on the opposite sides in Syria. They're in opposite sides in Libya. They're in opposite sides in Cyprus. Uh, and uh, they have been uh, more or less on the opposite sides here as well. Although, uh, of course, Russia has tried to be the balancer. It's seen as closer to, to Armenia uh, based on uh, the military alliances and the economic integration going on between those states than with, uh, with Azerbaijan. I am still not sure what role the OSCE uh, will play here if, um, if the Minsk group will uh, be able to resume a process. I think it would be very hard to for Azerbaijan to accept it in the current format with France as one of the co-chairs, uh, if, if not uh, that is balanced with, with Turkey being upgraded from a member to a, a co-chair. Um, and yes, there, uh, there is uh, one possibility here is that we just go into a new stalemate. Uh, but uh, I think it also depends a lot on how the, uh, the the ceasefire agreement is followed up and, and implemented uh, because there are uh, many stumbling blocks uh, associated with, with that. Uh, it was very short in detail, uh, but it uh, made some sweeping changes on the ground, like opening up a land corridor between Nakhichevan and Azerbaijan proper across uh, Armenian territory. Things like that would be difficult to implement and so, so I think first we have to watch here is how is this implemented on the ground and then um, I hope that European states, the EU and the US will become more involved in the region again but uh, during the, 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 the war this uh, this uh, fall, uh, I think there was, uh, um, yeah, they showed a, a, a lack of uh, interest and, and serious involvement in, in the conflict that was quite disappointing, I think. Thank you very much, Helge. That also answered <coughs> a question that has been sent in uh, partially with the quote, after the peace agreement, what is the Russian power status uh, in the region? And uh, I believe you have, uh, it is historically in uh, Russia's backyard and it is also uh, historically in Turkey's backyard. So it is also an open question about uh, how much real international involvement they will accept in this, uh, in this region. Would uh, any of the other panelists uh, weigh in with comments? Yes, Lena? Yeah, in terms of Russia's involvement in the region now, that um, uh, now when you consider Nagorno-Karabakh as the Euro part of Azerbaijan, it means that Russia now has military forces in all uh, the South Caucasus countries for the first time. And of course, for, for Azerbaijan, this was not well. Um, the war was a success in one way, but uh, the peace agreement uh, brought Russian soldiers to their territories. And many in Azerbaijan are not pleased with that because they say it would be much harder to get rid of the Russian occupiers than, than the Armenian occupiers, so to say. Um, and for Armenia, um, they had the formal cooperation with uh, Russia through the uh, CSTO, a collective security treaty organization, the Putin's um, NATO uh, similar. But it didn't come to effect because the fighting didn't take place in uh, Armenia proper. Uh, and on the other hand, they would have expected more support from Russia nonetheless. 
and like Helga said, they they uh, they try to keep a neutral position uh, and they sell weapons to both sides. Um, so it's um, it's a kind of a, a difficult relationship between between Armenia and uh, and Russia, and it hasn't become better now. And as I mentioned, there are protests against the prime minister in Armenia, and those are very much uh, Russia backed, in terms of uh, they are run by the oligarchs. Uh, with links to the previous regime, and they were very much <clears throat> related to sorry, <clears throat> to Russian economics. So it's it's a very complex uh, picture, and uh, but Russia is, is always uh, involved in one way or, or, or another. Thank you. I just got some technical issues here, uh, but would any of the other panelists like to weigh in? Uh, yes, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, and it's more of a question to, to Lena, uh, actually. Um, well, first, first about the, the, the Russian uh, position here. What, what, was it a victory or, or not? I think it was a diplomatic victory, and that's certainly how it's sold uh, in Moscow. But I'm not sure how strong uh, the, the military victory, in the sense of getting boots on the ground on Azerbaijani territory, is, because it is with a, uh, a time limit. Uh, they are there for five years and then uh, it's up to the parties to, to, to prolong this. So they, they may be kicked out and... Uh, yeah, so, 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 so this is not uh, necessarily a permanent uh, uh, position. But what I want to ask Lena about is perceptions in Armenia of this uh, defeat, who's to blame besides maybe the prime minister? Is it Russia that let Armenia down with not intervening military? Or can it be, is it sold like NATO country, Turkey, uh, was the decisive factor in the defeat here? So, so uh, in other words, is this pushing Armenia closer to Russia? or closer to Europe. Uh, how is this affecting the internal balance in Armenia between those two uh, directions? That's a really big, uh, big question. Um, in, in many ways, you can say that um, Turkey acted as uh, they expected, whereas Russia did not exactly act as expected. Um, so uh, previously, uh, Turkey hasn't been so much uh, vocally and physically and with uh, mercenaries and weapons and, and so on in uh, supporting uh, Azerbaijan, whereas they've always been there. Uh, now it was very uh, vocal and clear, whereas Russia was not that uh, visible until uh, the, uh, the negotiations towards the end. And a third factor here is also the EU or the, the West, so to say, because um, Armenians are maybe more disappointed with them because they had a democratic revolution, there was democratic elections, there has been a, a, a frailing democracy, but really developing in that direction. And they were expecting more, uh, more support from international community to support that initiative. And now they feel that the dictators of uh, Turkey, <laughs> Russia and Iran, uh, to <laughs> Azerbaijan, sorry, um, have um, succeeded in uh, fighting this tiny democracy with a war. And that's uh, and with the international community uh, only watching, so there is there is a disappointment uh, in Armenia towards uh, all, and I think at at the moment it's hard to see where where it will go. Actually, um, Turkey is uh, of course not where they will <laughs> um, seek uh, seek support. Uh, Russia is by by definition. Um, one of the the parties that they have to, to keep good relations to, so it will somehow get back there. But now the international, uh, like the internal um, discussions, are very much towards uh, Pashinyan, the, the prime minister, who really didn't um, hasn't been very much of a statesman in following up on on uh, on what he should do in this situation. There is, but there is also not support for the so-called oppositional groups. Um, I say so-called because they are not really oppositional groups. They are supported by this oligarchic previous regime and they just want the power uh, and they're taking advantage of, of this vacuum and, and unrest in Armenia at the moment. 
at the same time, the people know that these are linked to the previous regime and to Russia. So they're not really taking to the streets in support of this opposition. They are not pleased with Pashinyan, but not so little pleased that they will agree to, to, to throw him out and, and get back to the previous regime. So at the moment, it's very, um, it's very hard to say uh, where it will go. But um, uh, Europe and, and US definitely has uh, um, a, a great task in trying to show that we are really with you and your initiative was helpful. And uh, uh, because I think that's where the greatest disappointment lies, because they know Turkey and Azerbaijan did what they expected. And Russia has always been an, an, an ambiguous relation. But the biggest disappointment is with the, with the West and, and the rest of the international community. OK, thank you, uh, Lena. Uh, we are quickly running out of time. We have approximately four minutes left. Uh, we started with the uh, historical perspective on, on this conflict, which has been uh, frozen in periods, uh, hot in others, going back to before, uh, uh, before communist times. Um, what is your take on this, uh, Kori Johan? Uh, do you see a possible resolution in one way or another, land versus territory or some kind of exchange? What are the options? Um, I'm not sure if I have <laughs> so much to add on that in, in addition to what Lena and Helge has already said. Um, but we are definitely clear, struggling, still uh, clearly struggling with the Soviet legacy and the borders and uh, that when the Soviet system collapsed, um, the borders that were there was what became the international borders between sovereign states and uh, uh, they are very difficult to adjust, I think, uh, in many cases in the post-Soviet area, uh, uh, tell us this. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any last words from Helge or uh, Lena? So there was a, a question there from Christian Swanus about reconciliation. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe you are the right one to, to ask to, to answer that question, Yana, but but my take on that would be that it's very difficult to see in, in the in the current situation. My my experience is that when it comes to uh Nagorno Karabakh and Azerbaijan proper, uh, what you have seen is since 1994 that uh, new generations have been educated in hatred of the other. Uh, so uh, when there was something to build on back in 1994, when people, uh, IDPs, if they had returned at that, that stage, uh, they would have had some common ground that they could return to. Uh, after a quarter of a century, it's very difficult to see a successful reintegration of uh, Armenians and uh, Azerbaijanis in this territory. Yes, it looks like the, you got the final words there, um, Helge. It um, is a conflict, maybe uh, frozen, that has moved uh, this fall with um, at least a partial win for the Azerbaijani side. We have um, uh, external powers like Russia and Turkey who also have um, uh, interests in in this area. So uh, I would end by thanking the uh, panelists, um, Lena Vettelon from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, Kori Johan Mjör from the University of Bergen and Helge Blackisrud for uh, all of you joining us in this webinar. <laughs>